All right, so today we are going to be covering three chapters, Ezekiel 12, 13, and 14. Now, don't get scared here. Um, we're going to pick out and glean some stuff from 12 and 13 and then kind of land on 14. Um, so if you'll turn to uh, 12, um, we'll start off with what, uh, uh, what God is saying to us through Ezekiel and Ezekiel to his people Israel. And here we have uh, there in verse one again, a message came to me from God. Son of man, you live among rebellious, or rebellion, or rebels who have eyes, but refuse to see. They have ears, but refuse to hear for they are a rebellious people. So, he just said that they have capabilities of seeing and hearing, did he not? So they have that capability, but they refuse to use them or use them in the correct way. Jesus used this in Matthew 13, 9. Mm -hmm. He said, whoever has ears, let him hear. Yes. So he, he quoted the Old Testament a lot. Yes, he, he did. Back to like the Jonah and that. In his situation, the three days in that. So he, uh, uh, it, it's a symbol of uh, uh, you may have ears, but you have to have the Holy Spirit in our case to hear the correct message. Yeah. And the, you know, just because you can see doesn't mean you're not blind. That's right. Absolutely. But, and, and so. Yeah, we, we Jesus, blind, we can be blinded Jesus, by the world. Jesus used that a lot in. And it, and it does refer to the Son of Man. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. It's Jesus. Verse 3, so now, Son of Man, pretend you are being sent into exile. Pack a few items an exile could carry and leave your home and go somewhere else. Do this right in front of the people so they can see you. For perhaps... They will pay attention to this, even though they are such rebels. So Ezekiel has been used to provide some insight to his people prophetically, right, of, hey, this is coming, this is going to happen to you, and he's gone through several different things, and now God says, hey, I want you just to be an example, Good, pack a bag and just head out and maybe the people will pay attention to seeing you do this and you know maybe they'll listen and and they'll come and they'll question they'll ask and see what what's going on here um and as you continue reading down through uh, this chapter and i'm not going to go through everything here um you'll see that the, the people will come to a point where they're asking uh, Ezekiel, hey, what, what does all of this mean? And so he'll be able to explain to them, hey, this is the stuff that is going to be happening. God bless you. Bless and again, um, and then you get down to verse 21, and, and, and it's an interesting uh, verse. Because again, a message came to me from the Lord, son of man, you've heard the proverb, they quote in Israel, time passes and prophecies come to nothing. Now that don't sound right, does it? So prophecies that come to nothing would be from a false prophet, right? Because a false prophet is going to say just whatever junk comes out of his head and there's no proof in the pudding, as they say, because it doesn't come true. This also takes the control out of God and puts it with them. He goes on to say there in 23, tell the people, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I will put an end to this proverb 
and you will soon stop quoting it. Pretty direct. Now give them this new proverb to replace the old one. The time has come for every prophecy to be fulfilled. So in other words, God is declaring that, hey, my prophets who have been doing my work, all of that is going to come to pass. And you remember, if you go back to chapter 3, something happened to Ezekiel in chapter 3. Who remembers what that event was? No, we're not there quite yet. All right. Before he had to cook with the... Okay, but more importantly, God appointed him to be what? A guard, a watchman, right? He, he, right? And remember, Ezekiel wasn't, God didn't ask Ezekiel, hey, I got this job application, and I'd like you to apply for it. He just said, tag your it. Yeah. And, and so he's he's living this, and it's like, okay, got it. So God is continually bringing messages to him to deliver to the people. And now God has said, hey, all that junk that y'all been talking, right, because they've been going for 490 years in their own way, right, stinking thinking. And now God's patience has come to an end, and... He's going to bring some devastation onto the people. So now if we flip over to 13, if I can get this thing to flip for me. Now we have a chapter that's dealing with these false prophets. And so we read as we begin here, it says, This message came to me from the Lord, son of man, prophesies against false prophets of Israel who are inventing their own prophecies. Say to them, listen to the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says, what sorrow awaits the false prophets who are following their own imaginations and have seen nothing at all. Hmm. Continues. O oh, people of Israel, these prophets of yours are like jackals digging in the ruins. They have done nothing to repair the breaks in the walls around the nation. They have not helped it to stand firm in battle on the day of the Lord. So these prophets, their 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 livelihood is just making prophecies and going to people and telling fortunes and this and that and they're nothing and we're going to see here god has got something for them verse six instead they have told lies and made false predictions they say this message is from the lord even though the lord never sent them and yet they expect him to fulfill their prophecies. Can you, can your visions be anything but false if you claim this message is from God when I have not even spoken to you? <clears throat> so some pretty harsh words for these false prophets. You know, I go back to the uh, sons of Sceva, right? Uh, and Sceva was uh, one of the uh, priests in the temple. I remember, and this is out of Acts, and they were watching Paul go around and drive out demons. And, you know, and, and he was doing it in the name of Jesus. So they're like, hey, we can do that in the name of Jesus thing. And so they go out and they go to try and drive out this demon in this man. And the demon speaks and says what? What is Paul? Well, first he starts off, well, I know Jesus. I even know who Paul is. Paul, Paul has made a name for himself in hell, okay? He has rattled the gates of hell, so they know who he is. And then thirdly, well, who the heck are you? 
And so the demon in this man then proceeds to whoop up on his sons and tore, tore them up. And see, and that's what we have with these false prophets. They come and people are saying, hey, this is my prediction here. You know, you get into some of these uh, uh, religions today and they make all these grand predictions, these prophecies, and the date comes and the date goes. And so now there's an excuse. Well, there's a delay. You know, the, the, the God of whatever has delayed because he's given you a second chance. Okay, so now we're at the second chance. We're at the third chance. We're at the fourth chance. We're at the seventh chance now. And still, your prophecy isn't fulfilled. You are one of these that God is talking about here. You're full of lies. How can you go in the name of God? when God hasn't even spoken to you. And so, therefore, verse 8, he says, therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says, because what you say is false and your visions are a lie, I will stand against you, says the sovereign Lord. And get this, I will raise my fist against all the prophets who see false visions and make lying predictions, and they will be banished from the community of Israel. I will blot their names from Israel's record books, and they will never again set foot in the, their own land. Then you will know that I am the sovereign Lord. So, be careful about what you say. And then the latter part of this gets into the women prophets. Right? God is an equal opportunity. Okay. He's covering all of the bases here. Then we get into 14. So we're going to park a little here in 14. If I can get this thing to flip for me. There we go. And we're going to be back to idolatry and idolatry in the leaders. And so we see here as we begin Ezekiel 14, then some of the leaders of Israel visited me. And while they were sitting with me, this message came to me from the Lord. Now think about that for a minute. Leaders, y'all, y'all, y'all are the leaders. We gather together, and y'all are having counsel with me. And while this conversation and stuff is going on, a message from God comes. Now, I've talked to a lot of people about getting messages from God, and they'll tell you, "Hey, you, you, if you're going to get a message from God, you have to be in your prayer room. You have to be where it's quiet, and da da da. You got to, you, you know, and and." I'm like, no, God's talked to me in the middle of a situation. I'll tell you, I've come in here prepared for a lesson and thinking one way, and God says, no, we're going to go a different way. God speaks to us all the time. Now, sometimes that's an audible, like he's receiving this message from God. Sometimes it's in the circumstances uh, that are around us. Sometimes it's a person who will come and bring a word. But God is there always. The scripture says, where can you go that God has not already been at and cannot be at with you today? So this, this idea that, well, we, you got to be in a certain posture and a certain this to do that in order to hear from God. No, God speaks. You just got to be like he, we talked about earlier. They have ears. They have eyes. You just need to put them into use. You know, in the medical field, they can tell you that what happens to bedridden people 
is that muscles will atrophy, right? Which means they, 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 they start to become useless because they're not used. We talk about job skills, a, a, a job skill that is not used quickly fades away. You know, I remember when we got the, the Sin Guards uh, radio in the Army, okay? High tech, you know, all security, you know, before we, we had to have a secure box over here and a radio over here, it's high, you know, it, it, this was all now in one package. And boy, but, but you had to know how to do things and in sequence and stuff. And I tell you, if, if you left that alone for a period of time, you know, you had to go TDY somewhere for example, and you come back and you go, okay, what was that sequence? Again? <laughs> you know, you got to keep the skills up. So God says here, I'm talking to you in amongst this discussion. And he says, son of man, these leaders have set up idols where? in their hearts okay let's get to the heart of the matter now right because they are been all about idolatry well what is the source of that idolatry it is set up in their hearts they have embraced things that will make them fall into sin why should i listen to their request so that gives us a clue about some of the conversation that's going on they're going to the prophet. They know that he has been prophesizing and the prophecies is being fulfilled. So they're going to talk to someone who's in good with God. And obviously they're laying down some requests. Hey, when you talk to God next, can you, can, can you bless me and my friend over here? Well, my friend happens to be my mistress. We won't let my wife know, right? He goes on, he says, tell them this is what the sovereign Lord says. The people of Israel have set up idols in their hearts and have fallen into sin. So starts with the leadership, flows out to the people. And they go to the prophet asking for a message, right? a message from God. So I, the Lord, will give them the kind of answer their great idolatry deserves. So you're asking for, you're asking for a message from me. Okay. I'm about to give it to you. You know, it reminds me of, you know, kids, you know, they, they're coming up and, you know, you're in the middle of something and they, they keep, hey, 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 hey. You can stop now, or you're going to get both barrels. None of us have been in that situation, right? <clears throat> both in receiving and also doing to our own children. Okay. So I will do this to capture their minds and hearts of all the people who have turned from me to worship the detestable idols. So God says, I want to give you an answer. It's not going to be an answer you're going to like, but he's going to do this in order to recapture the mind and the heart because that's the source of all this sin. And when you think about that in our own lives, starts with a thought, Goes to the heart and gets the, hey, yeah, we're okay. Not the fact that your heart, your chest is, is doing one of these numbers. Right? Warning, warning, we're Robinson. Don't go there. And then you go, you know, you don't know. I really want to go waddle in that mud. And so we dive off. So this is where the Israel 6, therefore tell the people of Israel, this is what the sovereign Lord says, repent and turn away from your idols. He's giving you a way out. And stop all your detestable sins. I, the Lord, will answer all those, both Israelites and foreigners. So this is all encompassing. 
who rejects me and sets up idols in their hearts and so fall into sin and who then come to the prophet asking for my advice. I will turn against such people and make a terrible example out of them. Get this, eliminating them from among my people. They, then you will know that I am the Lord. Be careful what you go play with. Because what do they say? Play with fire? You won't get burned. He continues in verse 9. And if a prophet is deceived into giving a message, it is because I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. What? God says a prophet is deceived. <laughs> It's because God has deceived him. What the heck is that? What is it? Has God just lost his mind? Or is it that God is demonstrating that there ain't nothing that happens inside of his creation that he does not know about? or allow. You would compare that with uh, the Pharaoh when God said, I will harden his heart. Oh, come on, talk to me. Preach, preach. So he wouldn't, uh, as God even uses the enemies of us. Oh, you know, we went through Daniel and we have Nebuchadnezzar, right? Yeah. Did God not use Nebuchadnezzar to show who he was? Right? And yes, we see where God intervenes and he will direct things, all right, because that's who he is. Remember, Egypt, Egypt was a good place, all right, when his son, all right, and King Herod was coming after him, he said, Joseph, get up, take Mary and the child and go to Egypt. We see back in history that Egypt was the place that Shasha, or, uh, Joseph was sent. And then Egypt became the physical salvation of Israel. Because remember, Israel was the children of Jacob, who would then be name changed to Israel. But then because they adopted the idolatry of the Egyptians because they were in the land. Then God said, okay, fine. We're going to let you go into imprisonment, into slavery. And hopefully teach you a lesson. And that went on for how many years? Anybody remember? 430 years before then Moses comes onto the scene and leads the people out. And then again, they, they quickly at the Mount Sinai, God's, you know, given the commandments and, and the people, they quickly turn back to what they knew. Thus, you see in the scriptures, and a dog returns back to its vomit. Because that's what it, it, it knows. All right, go ahead. God uses the enemies, and in this example, even the enemies are within our own church. Oh, some are they they stumble into that, others they're no different than these prophets that are being talked of here. Yes, they are in our churches. In fact, we know that the enemy. Um, there are um, particular um, groups that will infiltrate a church, and they'll come in and they're hey man they're 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 like us, but what they're doing in the background is they're starting a little fight over here, so you know trying to get people gonna you know 
but they're there for a delivery. And, and I mean, these people are trained to go and do this within churches division. in order to create division, to tear down. Because if I can tear down the base, then it doesn't matter how strong the building is. Once the foundation is gone, that building's gone. And so that's what they do. They come in and they attack, right? And they it, and, and it's no different than what we do in the spy business, right? Infiltrate, come in, I'm a friend. You know, and sometimes, you know, that's over years. You know, we, we talk about sleeper cells here in this country. Don't you think we got sleeper cells ourselves in other countries? But the Holy Spirit should give discernment. Well, like that. that's if you're tuning into the Holy Spirit, okay? Because remember, Holy Spirit in I, in you, okay? And then I have to be in the Holy Spirit, then you get the fruit, okay? Don't forget the formula. You've got to remember the formula. You know, it's just like you have the ears, you have the eyes, they're functional, but you're not using them. You have the Holy Spirit, but if you're not using it, it has become atrophy. And it is just, it's useless because you're not exercising it. We got to exercise it. False prophets and those who seek their guidance will be punished for their sins, verse 10. In this way, the people of Israel will learn not to stray from me, polluting themselves with sin. They will be my people and I will be their God. I, the sovereign Lord, have spoken. So in other words, as Jesus talks about the sheep, the sheep who know my voice, they hear me and they will obey. The ones who are not my sheep will continue to go run and jump off cliffs. If you know anything about sheep, right? they will do that. They get to an edge of a cliff, they look over and go, hey, there's green grass down there. And they'll jump off to go down there. Thus, that's why you see a shepherd's hook, you know. You ever wonder why there was such a big hook on the end of a shepherd's hook? And then it's got the little curve back. That is literally so they could reach down and hook onto the sheet to pull them back up. And that's what Jesus does to the, his lost sheep. But there are sheep. They don't hear his voice anymore because they are not. But they're amongst the flock. And that's something, and, and you're right, discernment through the Holy Spirit will tell us whether that prophet, that preacher, that teacher, whomever is of God. And so we get into verse 12, and it's interesting. Um, 13, God gets in and he says, son of man, suppose, now get this, okay, God is talking to you and he says, hey, let's go a little hypothetical here. Suppose the people of a country were to sin against me and I lifted my fist to crush them, cutting off their food supply and sending a famine to destroy both people and animals. Just imagine that for a moment. Even Noah, Daniel, and Job were there. Even if those great men of God were there, their righteousness would save no one but themselves. This is what the Lord says. Hmm. So suppose, right, we're going to, God goes, hey, in verse 15, suppose I was to send wild animals into the country to kill and devour the people. Or, or suppose in verse 17, I were to bring war against the land and, and, and send an army to destroy the people and all the animals. Just suppose that. Or verse 19, suppose 
I were to pour out my fury by sending an epidemic into the land and the disease kills people and animals alike. As surely as I live, says the sovereign Lord, even if Noah, Daniel, and Job were there, they wouldn't be able to save their own sons and daughters. They alone would be saved by their righteousness. Would you, would you say this is kind of a, the idea that you can't be born into Christianity? You can't be born into salvation? You have to, it's not, you can't use somebody else in salvation to yourself. There, there, there's only one place of, and that's what he's saying. Yeah, here. one place of salvation. And I rise through Christ. Yes. My son or daughter can't uh, have the righteousness no. through me, no. uh, only through Christ. No, but and first that that direct line. Yes, and but we have, uh, of course, we have religions who do, that do that. Yes, they 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 believe that I can go in and I can do if the I'm sacrifice born, if I'm born for. This, yeah, you know I'm uh, you know I'm doing. It. Yeah, no, and 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 it's clearly here, uh, and of course God goes on here and. He, he says that how terrible it will be when all four of these dreadful punishments fall upon Jerusalem. Okay. And this is what this is all part of the prophecy that uh, Ezekiel has been laying down. Okay. And I mean, to the point of literally physically laying down on one side, flipping over mm -hmm. the other side for over a year. Okay. So there's lots of warning that's coming to the people. So he says, this is going to fall upon Jerusalem. War, famine, wild animals, disease, destroying all her people and animals. Yet, now get this, okay? Because remember, Ezekiel in previous chapters, right, when God was giving these prophecies, Ezekiel fell down on his face before God and said, are, are you going to wipe out all of Israel? And, and he wept bitterly for that. Okay, And we've seen this with uh, other prophets of God. We know that Moses, when he was up on the mountain and God said, all right, that's it, I'm, I'm wiping them out. And he said, Moses stood in the gap, right? And he said, Lord, you know, you can do what you want to do but I'm going to intercede on their behalf. And so he didn't wipe them all out. He wiped only some of them out. But eventually that entire generation, remember they wandered in the desert 40 years until that entire generation, with the exception of two, who were they? Caleb and Joshua. Caleb and Joshua, right? Were the only ones who were able to enter into the land because of, their sins, they're, they're, you know, doubting God. And so yet there will be survivors. They will come here to join you in exile in Babylon. So remember, his heart is broken because what's going to, the destruction is going to happen to his people. Those four things are going to come down on his people and his land is going to be devastated. And then he says here, you will see with your own eyes how wicked they are. And then you will feel better about what I have done to Jerusalem. When you meet them and see their behavior, you will understand that these things are not being done to Israel without cause. I, the sovereign Lord, have spoken. Now think about it. why did God need to give Ezekiel a reason for what he was doing? Did he? No. All right. Matter of fact, we 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 rarely see this in scripture. Usually it's because I am the Lord. We, we've been seeing you will know that I am the Lord because of the things that I am doing. But here, he takes the time to say, Ezekiel, look, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to 
have some of the survivors come and join you. And when you sit down to talk to them, like you're sitting and talking to these people now, you're going to see them for what they really are. And that should quiet your heart as to why my heavy hand has come down. Alan? Uh, I think part of this is uh, his relationship with him. Didn't yes. See, um, he gave him an explanation here, and he says that uh, at the end, you'll be consoled when you see their conduct and their mm -hmm. actions, when you will know that I have done nothing in it without cause. And so he's telling Ezekiel, well, I'm doing all these things, but you and I have this relationship. Yes. I, you are my messenger. You are my prophet. And so therefore, you deserve to know this because of our relationship. Uh, I, I think that's, that's what he Yeah, saying. no. And yeah. Go ahead. We have the same boldness that Ezekiel had. We can have that same relationship with God. Oh, man. Yeah. What, you know, I mean, have that one on one conversation with him. Well, see, and it, and it goes also to the point because, you know, even Paul is as is, is close to God as he was. God didn't answer all of his questions. Now, some of them he did, but there were a lot of his questions. He just said, hey, you know what? My grace is sufficient. You know, you, you you don't need to worry about the answer. You just need to do. So to have this kind of relation that God, and, see, and it also shows God's heart. He for, for, for the heart of Ezekiel. Yes, Ezekiel was, you know, kind of, you know, God, are you doing the Moses thing? Are you really going to kill all of them? Wipe them out. And he said, no, not all of them. There's going to be a remnant. But, but you need to understand in that remnant, Dude, I mean, you know, out of 100%, you know, 98% of them, you know, just to put some numbers to it, God's going to take out. And then that 2% is the seed, which is then going to replant and regrow the Israel people. And of course, we, we stand on this end of history, and we know that that isn't the last time that they go into idolatry, go their own way, okay? Now, we do finally see a, a change in Israel, um, you know, into the modern times uh, when they become a nation again, you know, and we read uh, in previous chapters that God says, you know, he's going to scatter the people and then there will be a point in time he'll bring them back. And we know that that is happening today. You know, the people are being, they're coming back from the lands that they were scattered to. All right. So, but it's just an amazing relationship that Ezekiel has with God. Because, I mean, just, just look at the number of times, look at the number of conversations that he has had with God. You know, and granted, a lot of it is just kind of hitting the, the same ground again about warning the people, dude, this is going to happen. You know, to the point of, hey, pack your bags like you're going into exile and head out the door and do it in broad daylight so people will see you. And, and maybe somebody will recognize, and, and there were people that do, because they if you read through the rest of that chapter, they come in and says, what does all this mean? Well, it means this is what's going to be happening to us, to the people. If you don't fall by the sword, then famine will get you. If famine don't get you, the wild animals will get you. If wild animals don't get you, the disease will get you. And all of this, because the heart of the matter is that even if you, if I went out and I tore down every idol in my life, I went to the high hills, I tore down the Asherah pole, I tore down my altars to false gods, and I did that all before you, so I can be a deacon. Okay, I, I can say, hey, yeah, 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 you know, I've, I've gotten, I've, I've put all that stuff behind me. 
but I haven't tore it down in my heart. Have I accomplished anything? No. no. Because all the manifestation of that stuff out in the physical all was derived from the core and the starting point, which is the heart. Yeah. Because remember, where, where does it say that when Christ died, three days on the third day rising, where did the temple go? Because remember, the curtain was torn from top to bottom. Where did the temple go? It's not just in me, it's in my heart, because that's the core. So what is what is your heart today? Go ahead, Bernard. Oh, I was just thinking when he tells these people that he will leave a remnant of people mm -hmm. in a small cluster of them. That that has been throughout, correct? Sure. I mean, when Noah took his people. Yes, when he when he wiped out the world, right, there was a remnant. Yep. Abraham and yep. he left Lot and all mm -hmm. that. So he's been, as he said, the same today, tomorrow, and forever, all the way through. But these people can't see it like I could. <laughs> yeah, well, you got a comment? <laughs> yeah, there's good news in this. Give it to me. If you look at those three guys there, <laughs> yep. Noah, Job, and Daniel. Yeah. I think if I was in any one of those guys' situations, I'd been on the outside looking in. I would have been drowned in the flood with Noah. I would have been burnt in the fire. And uh, once those swords and stuff, once the devil attacked me by Job, I would have probably cursed him, cursed God, and gave up. Mm -hmm. That's who I am. Mm -hmm. Their righteousness would have saved them in this situation. I don't think I could raise my level of that righteousness, but thank God my righteousness is not based on me now. No. My righteousness is his righteousness. Yeah. It is he who covers me. Because great men like that, and, and when we say great men, you know, you even you can add David to that, right? And David had his many flaws, okay? But he was a man after God's own heart, and that's where it is. He was after God's heart. Is my heart after God? Is my heart after the things of God, or is my heart after the things of this world, okay? And, and, and am, I, am I working to take the grace and mercy that God gave me for today, and am I drinking deeply of his resources, or am I setting it aside and going, I got this? You know, as we were talking before class began, control. Who should have control of my life? Well, the world says you should. Scriptures and what God says is give it to me. Jesus said, take my yoke. Give me yours. And oh, by the way, carry your cross. An emphasis, it's your cross. You can't carry his cross. You can't carry my cross. You got to carry your cross. And if you got your cross on your shoulder with one hand and your bucket of grace and mercy and all my supply in this hand, you're going to be all right. Guaranteed. Let us pray. Gracious Father, God, we thank you for your word and your message. And Lord, help us to to get that kind of relationship or draw closer to that relationship that Ezekiel had with you. That Lord, we would take the warnings and, and change the condition of our heart that it would be after you rather than the things of this world. Lord, your blessings and favor be upon us as we go from here today in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys. And we will see you next week. And I want to hear your stories about your bucket being empty. <laughs> All right.